you very much for attending. My name is Ajit Mambo. I'm a nutrition and trainer here at Humanitarian Global. And today we are going to be looking at the nutrition assessment, which is one of the key area in nutrition and dietetics practice. Feel free to inquire anything that you do not understand. And I hope that we are going to have an interactive session. So maybe we can begin. So in today's session, we will focus on nutrition assessment. And we are hoping to have some, some learning outcomes. We will want to know how to assess nutrition assessment by this session. And then we also know what is the importance of nutrition assessment. Why do we do that nutrition assessment? And then what are the methods that we use in carrying out nutrition assessment? And then for every method, we are going to explore the, the advantages and the disadvantages of each method. That is the broad methods, not specific methods, only those advantages and disadvantages of each key method. Thereafter, we are also going to understand, we are going to be able to explain what are the ways in which nutrition assessment can be applied in the humanitarian context. Since our organization is a humanitarian organization, we want to see how we can apply this nutrition assessment to carry out our duties for the good of the humanity. So those will be the expected outcomes of our session today. So to move on, we have a small introduction here. So I want to mention and say that nutrition assessment is a key step in the nutrition care process. Every dietitian, every nutritionist, before they perform their duties, they are supposed to follow a designated program or a process which has about four steps. And the nutrition assessment is usually the step which allows us to collect data so that we can be able to evaluate that data and get the problem. That is a nutrition problem. Thereafter, we can be able to come with an intervention and we can monitor that intervention to see that the nutrition problem is cleared. So here in our introduction, we just want to mention that uh, uh, it is the first step of the nutrition and dietetic care process. And in this process, we first determine the nutrition status of the individuals or the subgroup or the populations. Here we deal with clients, we deal with the patients, and we can deal them in, um, as individuals or groups or populations. So we determine the nutrition status and nutrition status, first of all, we, it is the condition of the body as influenced by the utilization of the nutrients what we say in nutrition, that we are made of what we feed on. If you feed well, you are going to have a good nutrition status. If you do not feed well, you're going to have a poor nutrition status. And a poor nutrition status may lead to health problems. So before any nutritionist or dietitian does anything to help an individual or a subgroup or a population, we need to determine the nutrition status in this process of nutrition assessment that we can know how to start. And that is what helps us to come up with the nutrition care when we know the nutrition status. Generally, we have nutrition status that is good or a nutrition status that is poor. And that will form the basis of the nutrition care plan. Somebody asked you to define, telling them that it is the first step of the nutrition care process, you will be able to tell them that in this step, it involves the collection and interpretation of the information, which will enable us to make decisions about the nature of, and the nature and the cause of the nutrition related health issue that affects the individual, a group or a population. So in nutrition assessment, we can see the key thing there we are collecting and interpreting information so that we can have a care plan. So the core purpose of nutrition assessment 
it is to obtain that data, to verify that data, and to interpret that data so that we can be able to identify the nutrition-related problem, what are their causes, what are the significance, then thereafter, we can now be able to come with a nutrition intervention. So that is the simplest definition of nutrition assessment. Now, what is the importance of nutrition assessment? What are the reasons that may promote us to do nutrition assessment, either for individuals or for groups? Now, nutrition assessment will help us to identify the people or individuals who are at risk of malnutrition. They do not, uh, they are not malnourished, but they are very near to, to get malnourished. So when we identify these people who are at risk, we are able to do an early intervention. You know, we carry out measures that will now prevent them from becoming malnourished. And then the nutrition assessment also help us to identify individuals or groups who are already malnourished. And from there on, now we can offer appropriate care plan or treatment for them. It is through nutrition assessment where in the pediatric um, field, we are able to track the child growth. You know, sometimes when we want to define growth in the simplest terms, we usually say it is an increase in a size. So how we do that is through nutrition assessment. We can only know that a child has is growing through the various methods of nutrition assessment. When we are doing a nutrition assessment and through various methods, we are also able to identify medical complications that may affect the body's ability to utilize the food that the individuals or the groups of people eat. So we will find that in those methods of nutrition assessment, we do a medical history and we may identify that some of the medical complications like the medical conditions or the, you know, the metabolic complications that affect people may interfere with the way these people use food and it may make them not be able to get the um, maximum or optimal nutrition from the food, the nutrients that they ingest despite the fact that the food is there because of the medical complications that are there. So if we realize this, we work together now with the medical team to uh, help these people to solve those medical complications so that they can be able to ingest and utilize the food and nutrients that they feed on. Now the nutrition assessment uh, processes will also help us to detect practices that can increase the risk of malnutrition and infection. You know, there are some practices that various communities, that various individuals, that is the lifestyle or the manner in which they do things. Some people do not eat some things. Some people uh, prepare foods in certain ways that at the end of it all, you might find that there are no nutrients in it. Those practices they have an effect on the state of nutrition for some individuals and groups. So it is through uh, nutrition assessment that we come up and we realize these practices and we are able to help these people. Now, when we do a nutrition assessment, we get to know the nutrition uh, status, we get to know the nutrition problem where it is, and that is why it is important because now we come up with an appropriate nutrition care plan and we are able to inform the individuals or the groups through a nutrition education and counseling, um, which is also a unit that we offer here at the Human Global um, Organization. We are able to also inform these people through educating them and counseling about how to deal with the nutrition care problem. We have uh, the solutions to the nutrition status problem that, is, that are related to the health issues. Now, as we said, the nutrition assessment is, it is a process of collecting the data. And this data is the one that we interpret to find out what are the nutrition problems. So here we have a comment where we are saying that nutrition assessment data for individuals, when we are dealing with individuals, it 
usually come directly from the patient or the client through processes such as interviews, through observation, through, through measurements, through their medical records, or even through references from their healthcare provider. When we get information from, from population groups, this information can be got from the surveys, data from surveys, from administrative um, data sets, from studies such as epidemiological or research studies. That is where we usually get some of these assessment data that can be analyzed and interpreted to mean the nutrition related problems that these individuals or groups may have. So in this session, we are going to explore the methods that we nutritionists and dietitians who are practicing usually apply to get this data. And we will see that we use methods that we call the ABCD to remember. And these methods will include anthropometric measurements, biochemical laboratory methods, clinical methods, which will uh, include, you know, the sense and symptoms and other medical history. And then we also have the dietary data, which is very important uh, for us to determine the nutrition status of people. So I'll go on and then um, start. These are the, the methods that we are saying nutrition assessment can be done using the ABCD methods. These refer to the anthropometry, biochemical methods, clinical methods, dietary methods, and of course, other relevant information because we have to take things like medical history, the medication, the supplementation, the knowledge and beliefs, the physical activity, the quality of life, even socioeconomic status will have an effect of on the nutrition status of individuals because it will affect their lifestyle. So now we will start exploring these methods. Remember, we usually call them ABCD methods so that we do not forget. So we start with um, anthropometry, uh, which is a method of data collection in nutrition assessment. So anthropometry, it is a word that has its origin from the Greek language. Anthropos means human, uh, metric means measurement. So anthropometry, we can say in the simplest terms, they are human body measurements. So we usually take measurements, we will discuss how we do that shortly. And these measurements, they are non-invasive meaning we do not get inside of the body, we just measure the surface, the surface areas of the body. And then they give quantitative figures, they give amounts in numbers so that we can be able to identify the quantities of the various parts of the bodies. Now, the most common anthropometric measurements that we take are the height and length of humans, their weight, how heavy they are, their head circumference, their body circumferences, such as waist, hips, and lips, their skin fold thickness, their body mass index, all these methods, we are going to discuss them. Now, we will not have completed the definition of anthropometric measurements if we do not say that they are comparative body measurements. If we just have the measurements itself, it will not make sense, not unless we compare it to reference values. So that's why we are saying a single anthropometric measurement such as height or weight does not normally in self assess nutrition status. It has to be interpreted, that is, it has to be compared with the reference values, that is by age and by sex. And we are saying that such reference values or standards usually are sourced from um, databases uh, which have already been worked on. Examples, the World Health Program, we have the Center for Disease Control, we have, we have even internal uh, references that are there. So if you take your height or weight, if for instance, if you take the weight and we find that you are a uh, a, a young male adult and you are 65 kgs 
it will not mean anything not unless you compare it to some reference data. Yeah, wait, to people of the same age as you, the same sex as you, who are healthy, so that we know such a, um, a person of your age and sex who is healthy, is how, weighs how heavy, and are you near? Are you in that range or not? That is what we are calling the, the reference values or standards. So we must not forget that now, in the simplest terms, anthropometric measurements are body measurements. We take the body measurements and we compare them to different standards. I hope that, that is also um, understood. Now, anthropometric measurements, those human body measurements, are generally categorized into two. We have those ones that are used to assess growth, such as the length, the height, the weight, the head circumference, the head chest ratio. And these measurements are very essential in children to evaluate their physical growth. We also have measurements that um, analyze the body composition. And uh, good examples are body circumferences and skin fold thicknesses, and also other sophisticated uh, methods that we'll look at shortly. Now, body compositions will help us to analyze what are the components of the bodies because the ratios of the components of the body may have some health effect. For example, we will be looking at the ratio of fat to the lean muscle. If you have too much fat compared to the lean tissue that you have, then we are going to find that that person is going to, have to be obese or overweight or even other situations that are unhealthy. We need to have proper quantities of lean tissue, that is the non-fat mass and the fat mass. So we we'll look at such methods that help us and such methods for body composition will help us to identify underlying nutrition status and the diagnose the health risks. So we are going to start now to look at the anthropometric measurements that assess growth. So we say that these are generally for children. Children are the ones who are still growing. And um, children, based on the um, race of somebody, people grow up to the early 20s. Thereafter, growth stops. But now these measurements that we are looking at are really applicable in the young age of children and adolescents. So they are used in the pediatric population to evaluate the general health status, the nutrition adequacy, and the growth and development pattern of the child. So these growth measurements uh, show the normal growth patterns, and they are the gold standards by which the health practitioners assess the health and the well-being of a child. That is why every time a child is born, we take some body measurements, and then we continue monitoring those measurements to find out if the child is growing and developing as it should. So these me measurements are as follows. We are going to look at the most common ones. The first one is the length and height. Now, the difference between length and height is that length is taken for children who are very young, those ones who cannot stand because they are very young, we call it the recumbent length. They are, it is usually taken when the child is lying down on the measuring equipment. We take it from the crown to the heel. Now, height is taken vertically for children who are now older, people who are older than two years, and they can stand. That is what height is. So length is the horizontal position and height is there vertical position, and this the determinant here is the age. Length is for the very young, below two years, and height is for anybody above two years. Now, we use several equipment. For very young children, we use uh, the length board or the sliding board or the um, some kind of meter that we are going to look at right now to take the length. And for children and adults who are above two years, we use a height board or a standiometer or 
a portable agrophometer. Now, this equipment have various, are referred using various terms depending on the setup you are. But all what we need to know is that we have a hytometer. A hytometer, or a, you can call it that way just to, for everybody to understand, but it comes with very different terms. Now, here in Kenya, where we use the metric system, the measurement is taken in centimeters to the nearest millimeters because our reference standards that we use, especially the WHO, they usually um, have the measurements in centimeters. So here is a picture where you can see a very young baby. This is a newborn. And the meter that is being used here, it is a soft kind of um, portable meter. It's called a neonatometer, which is used to measure the length of young babies. Commonly, it is used to measure the length of these newborns. We can also explore other kind of uh, measurement. You can take anthropometric measures, proper skills that are recommended to take the height. Now, we can see that for the recumbent length, the child is lying there on the sliding board. The sliding board has a headboard and it has a, a sliding piece. You can see the way the health practitioner there, there are two of them, they are holding the child. The head has to be properly positioned at the headboard and this have to lie flat. You can see the guy is using the arm there to make sure that the knees are together and they are lying flat on the board. And then they have pushed the sliding piece and the measurements are always found at the side of the board there. Maybe one day we can also practice that in our fields. When standing, we can see we are using um, and then we stand, not some that the person has to bear shoes and straight. In order to stand straight, we ensure that the heels are touching the board of the board to make sure they are straight. The behind kind of is also that the board are straight, looking the level here. So that's how somebody stands straight. Also is up there and we record the measurement immediately after we take. It's important to note that whenever you are taking measurements, the eye level of the person taking the measurements should be directly to the uh, measuring board. The, that is a movable piece where the height is. Too tall or too shorter, it may affect the measurement you take. So make sure that uh, the eye level will be exactly at where the pointer of the measurement is. So that is length and weight of um, as a common anthropometric measurement that is taken. And we have another metric measurement that it is weight. And we are being told here that uh, it is used for growth monitoring when we take weight for growth monitoring in uh, young children. And in adults, we also take it to monitor their nutrition status. There are two general types of scales that we use. We have uh, beam scales or digital scales, and we take weight, weight here in Kenya to the nearest 100 grams, because that is our metric system. And like in the American system where they use, you know, the other systems of English systems, they use uh, inches and feet. Here in our system, we use the metric system because our reference standards come in the metric system. So whenever you are taking the weight, ensure that you have a well calibrated scale so that it can give you the right measurements. Ensure that the person is in a light hospital gown or light clothes and they do not have shoes or things in their pockets or anything that could interfere with the weight. 
So here we have the examples of the scales. Now in pediatric, uh, in, um, for children, we usually have several types of scales. You can see the first scale there with the baby hanging there. We usually call it a, a, a weighing sling or a hanging scale. It's also called a salter scale. That type of scale is a beam scale. You can see there is a pointer that moves on and off and it is used to, in conjunction with a, a hook and a weighing punt. And there's a proper uh, skill of using it. So um, is we are using a digital pan type scale, pediatric, uh, pediatric scale, uh, examples there. You can see the measurements there, the digital. Now we don't have a beam. That is the difference between the beam and the digital scale. For adults, these are the kinds of scales that we use. We, the first scale there is called a beam balance scale. You might have come across it in your practice or somewhere. You move it um, to and fro somehow until it balances with the weight. A beam balance scale, the same as a pointer according to the weight. It is also called a spring scale. And then easiest to use there, we have the digital scale uh, where we can see the guy standing there and he's saying that he's 69.6. So those are the types of skills that are used. They're easy to use. And we continue to gain more skills as we use them with our clients or on our practice or internship or whatever we are getting that field experience. So the next measurement used to assess growth uh, is head circumference. Now, the head circumference is a measurement which we take along from the forehead all the, way, all the way to the back part of the head, along the, um, the forehead to the back of the head. And it is measured to the nearest millimeter using an unstretchable measuring tape. This measuring tape usually is around uh, 0 0.6 centimeters wide. Then the circumference of the children is compared to the existing standards to monitor growth. You see as a child grows, it should also have its brain grow and therefore the head also should grow. Now, just to mention here, the average, note I'm saying the average, head circumference at the birth is around 34.5 centimeters. Plus or minus something there. The first month, it increases to about 36 centimeters. Now you can see that there is growth. Because at the back, we also know that uh, children is usually bigger in proportion to the rest of the pattern growth we are going to see. So we use head to monitor the growth of When head surface are safe, we are in assessing the that we as the brain grows from two years of life. After two years, the brain is no more sluggish and the head circumference is not useful. So that is why this measurement is very applicable for children below two years, because that is when the brain grows faster and the head is supposed to grow faster. After that, we really not normally use head circumference, not unless in special cases. So there is a picture there that is showing some conditions that are clinical conditions that are referred um, some could be medical or genetics or infections or other problems, but ours, we need, just need to know if the cause of sluggish growth is because of nutrition, poor nutrition. So as very small head is, condition is referred to as microcephaly, when the head is smaller than the average, and when the head is bigger than normal, it's called microcephaly microcephaly, and that is when the head is larger than normal. And I've said these conditions, other than nutritional causes, they could also have other causes, but we need to rule out uh, that it's not nutritional. And if it is medical or genetic, then it can be dealt other by 
the other team. Remember, nutritionists will work in the health team among together with the other practitioners, health practitioners. Now, the other measurement that is used to assess growth is head chest ratio. And we are saying here that the relationship of the circumference of the head to that of the circumference of the chest in infants and children ranges changes with age. Now, we usually take these measurements routinely so that we can detect if there are abnormalities in the brain and in the overall growth. So we are giving a, an example there. We are saying like a, a newborn's head when a baby is born, its head is about two centimeters or 0 0.78 inches larger than the chest sizes. Both the measurements, that is the head circumference and the chest circumference is about equal. Then after two years, the chest size becomes now larger than the head. If we see a similar uh, trend, we are going to know that the baby or the child is growing. So that is how we take the chest circumference. We use also a measuring tape. We wrap it around the, the chest at that position. We can see in that child there. Remember, we already know how to take the head circumference, and then we do uh, we check to see what is the difference according to the age of the baby. Now, we have come to the second part of the anthropometric measurements. We say that the anthropometric measurements are generally categorized into two. Those that are used to assess growth, we have looked at some of them. And now we are going to look at the ones that are used to assess body composition. So body composition refers to the components of the body. You know, the body is composed of various components. We have the organs, we have the fluid, we have the bone tissue, the fat tissue, we have the muscle tissue, all those. So generally, body composition is going to be the body fat and the fat-free mass. So anything that is not fat, we call it a fat-free mass. And it's also referred to as lean tissue, you know. And the lean tissue is the one that composes of anything that is not fat, that is the muscle, the body water, the body, the organs, all that. Those, they are anthropometric measurements that help us to assess the body composition. Because the ratio of this fat and fat-free mass, mass in humans will have health status of that we are going to look at the circumference, some work measurement, the skin fold thickness, the hip to waist ratio. And we have also other sophisticated methods that are used in the clinical setup, which we are also going to mention. So we start with the work. This is a mid upper circumference. And we are saying this measurement here is the circumference of the left upper arm. Okay, not necessarily the left upper arm. It depends if somebody is left or right-handed. So I would rather want to change that and say the non-dominant upper arm. Because you know the non-dominant arm is the one that is not so muscular because you don't utilize it. So that non-dominant upper arm, we take uh, the midpoint and then we tape. We have several measuring tapes to take some measurements. Now, to determine the upper arm, uh, we usually locate the shoulder bone tip, tip and the tip of the elbow, and then we take that measurements. We divide by two, and then there we are going to take to have the midpoint of the upper arm. We are doing this with a person standing or you know, and then we make them fold their arm at 90 degrees, and then we take the measurement of that upper arm to locate the midpoint. Now the mark, we are going to call it mark to, to mean middle upper arm circumference is usually used to indicate 
and nutrition. And it, in this case, it helps us to know severe and moderate acute undernutrition in children between six and 59 months. So we normally use it not on newborns, but children who are six months to five years old of it. We also use it on expectant women, lactating uh, women to assess malnutrition, and especially during um, if they are suffering. Can see the pictures there. We are mentioning that the MUAC uses a measuring tape called, called uh, the MUAC tape or the middle upper arm circumference tape. We can see we have two tapes there, a longer one and a short one, and they are color coded there. We'll explain about the color. The short one is usually allowed to 0.5. Long. Mentioning that the MOAC is a measure of the sum of the muscle and the subcutaneous fat in the upper arm. And in severe malnutrition, the both, both the fat and the muscle are reduced in the upper arm. That is why we measure the, the middle upper arm circumference to see if the muscle or the fat is reduced, which would indicate malnutrition. So there is a picture of a child there. You can see some people taking. Um, the measurements of them work there. And as I said, uh, we have many tapes, but uh, the common tape that uh, sourced from who, uh, usually for ease of use, comes with a color code. It has a part that is green, it has a part that is yellow, and a part that is uh, red. Now, for the child, I will just use this as for the child, although for the adult also has similar measurements and uh, color codes. For the child, the red color is usually from 0 0.00 centimeters to 11.5 centimeters red. And that means severely mal. And then the yellow will be from 11.5 centimeters to 12.5 centimeters and it is indicated that means um, uh, moderately acute malnutrition. And the green part starts from 2.5 centimeters going on once. That means that there's no malnutrition. The child is normal. So for ease of use, the work tips, quality work tips have been color coded to help the practitioner able to categorize this child very easily. Now, these are some of the MOAC tips, uh, the, the MOAC cut of points classify nutrition status. Remember we say uh, we can use MOAC for children, for adults during farming, men and women, to have an indication of how nutrition status has been affected, and for the pregnant and lactating women. Now, this is a um, the cut of points that we use to, to classify nutrition status using the MOAC tape. For the adolescents, that is people who are 15 to 18 years, severe malnutrition or severe underweight, their measurements will be below 18.5 centimeters, color coded red. For moderate uh, malnutrition, it will be between 18.5 to 21.9. That means there is moderate undernutrition. And if there's anything above 22.0 centimeters, it means that they are, they are normal, they are not malnourished. And the same with adults. Adults, including the pregnant and lactating women, even male adults during the starvation period, the famine, in will indicate severe malnutrition. 19 to 21.9 is moderate, and above 22, that is going to be Okay, so those are some of the standards that are applied. So that is a work measurement. Now the next measurement that is used to assess body composition, it's not so common, but it has been used in several setups, is the skin fold thickness. 
So these skin fold measurements are used to estimate the general fatness and the distribution of the subcutaneous adipose tissue. Let's just remain, remember that the subcutaneous adipose tissue or fat is the kind of fat that is found underneath the skin. So the kind of fat that is all under our skin, which has its purposes, you know, like thermoregulation and other purposes is the one that is called subcutaneous. We have another type of fat called referred to as visceral fats found in the body. Those ones that are in our abdominal cavity and those ones that surrounds or cushions our um, organs, that is called visceral fats. Now here we are talking about subcutaneous adipose tissue, which is the fat under the skin. So we use a device called a skin fold caliper, which is used to assess the skin fold thickness so that we can predict. Remember, we are using the term predict here, uh, meaning that it is not going to be so reliable, but it can give an indication, it can give a picture of the general um, fat, amount of fat that is found under the skin and of the body, you know, the skin covers all the body. Now, this method is based on the hypothesis. We are saying based on the hypothesis, hypothesis that the body fat is equally distributed over the body and the thickness of the skin fold is a measure for subcutaneous fat. Now, because it's a hypothesis, we are just assuming that all um, body parts, all, this, all the body fat is equally distributed over the whole body. So some of the skin folds thickness, uh, thickness measurements that are commonly used to determine the total amount of body parts are found in various body. So some of them will, will be the biceps. This will be the, the middle upper arm. And here we also use the non-dominant arm. If you are right-handed, use the left. If you are left, you use the right. So bicep skin fold. Then we also have the tricep skin fold. That's the back side of the middle upper arm. We have the subscapular skin fold just under the lowest part of the shoulder blade and behind there and the, the lowest mm, point of the, the shoulder blade. If it is a lady, that is uh, under the bra line there, at the back, that is what we take those fats that are there and measure them. And then we have the other spreliac skin fold, which is uh, above the upper bone of the hip. Uh, those are some of the common ones. Otherwise, more exists. Now, the reference standards of of the skin fold usually come with the, they are found, they differ from different sources. And when you buy a caliper, a skin fold caliper, comes with the reference measurements that should be referred to. So here I have not indicated the specific um, reference values because it will depend with the skin fold caliper that you are using. So whenever you buy a skin fold, it will, caliper, it will have a booklet with the various cutoff points for various parts of the body. So ensure that you follow those uh, reference points which come for different ages and for different sexes. So it's a, a big uh, booklet that should be used to interpret the skin fold measurements. Just to show you how the, the skin fold, some of the brands of the skin fold caliper look like, this is one there. And uh, you can see they are taking the tricep skin fold thickness there. We said tricep is the back of the upper arm. That is how you take it. You can see that meter there that is having some measurements. The measurements are taken in millimeters and the standard values also come with the millimeters. We can also take a baby. Now that is a subscapular skin fold thickness of a, a child. You can also see they are using a type of a caliper that is plastic. It's not so as a meter there. That is. Then we have another body composition anthropometric measurement. Uh, people talk about the waist circumference. Um, I like to talk about the waist to hip ratio. You know, 
waist to hip ratio is a little bit more reliable than the waist measurements because we cannot just give a fixed waist for all men and for all women, considering that there are other facts that are, would determine the health range because of the skeletal tissue or the build. You know, there are people who not necessarily fat, but they are just huge because of their build. We cannot expect them to have a smaller waist so that we can say that they have a healthy waist circumference. That is why now we are turning to the waist to hip ratio for giving an indication of body composition. This will give us an indication of the fat distribution, that is the abdominal um, obesity. Now the waist to hip ratio, you take the main dimensions of the waist in any measure, because it's a ratio you can take in centimeters or the inch, and then you take of the hips. Now the waist is the smallest point at your waist. Uh, sometimes when we are looking at how you make, you make the waist measurements, we tell people to bend sideways and that very small part of the waist where they are bending sideways, that is where you put the tape measure. We make and we measure snugly, and then we measure the widest part of the hips. And then we divide the waist measurements, divide by the waist measurement, and then we get the ratio. Whatever measurement, you, if you take measurement in inch for the waist, you have to take measurement in inch for the hips. If you take in centimeter likewise, we use a measuring tape. Now, for women, they are, it is recommended for a healthy waist to hip ratio, the ratio should be less than 0 0.8. And for men, it should be less than 0 0.95. If the figures are above, then we start uh, noticing that somebody has abdominal obesity. So these are how we take the measures. You can see the pictures there. I've already explained how we work out the ratio. We have the a chart here that gives us the cutoff point. Remember we said anthropometric measurements are comparative body measurements. We have to compare them to the reference values. So we are saying women have um, or lower men lower. That means and uh, the The risk and men is also indicated there. I am health risk who have 0 0.86 ratio or higher, and for men, one or higher. Now, what are these health risks that we are talking about? We are able to mention here that the people who carry more weight around their middle section and their hips may be at a higher risk of developing certain health conditions. Uh, that is like insulin resistance, that is diabetes, and some conditions of cardiovascular conditions. They are, have a higher risk because of the fat, the situation of the fat, which uh, contributes to uh, some health problems when it is high in the abdominal region. Now, other body composition measurements that we use are normally used in um, there are sophisticated methods that need sophisticated equipment and they are normally used in clinical setups. Like now we have the dual, dual energy X-ray optometry, which we normally refer commonly as DEXA. It's a type of scan which when, when you get um I think we can uh... Take a five minutes break as we have our speaker to just uh, also take some water. Okay. And I can see a few of you have a questions here and there. So kindly write on them, write the questions on the QA section, and we shall be answering them in a few. So, yes, we can take a five minutes break and then we can come back.
Uh, thank you for the break. Uh, I think we can come back. Uh, so, Annette, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, and I'll just repeat again, in case you have any question, uh, you can uh, write it on the Q&A section and our speaker will get to answer the questions. Uh, so over to you, Annette. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Am I clear to everybody? I've seen some people saying that um, it's not clear. I hope now it is clear. Maybe I can start by answering some question I have seen here. I will continue to answer the others as we go on. Now I have seen a question from Esther Otien, who would want to know that in case there is a child with a microcephaly that is a small head circumference, how do you solve it uh, within a early age. Now, microcephaly, which is determined by measuring the child and getting the measurements, which are low, they are lower than the normal, is a condition that can source from different um, causes. So the first thing is that we are going to work with the medic to determine. When you get such a child, you refer that child to the physician and then they will determine, they do a clinical um, evaluation to determine what could be the cause. Because uh, microcephaly can have um, such origin, such as problems that occurred during the development of the baby in the fetus because of uh, drug use and alcohol use because of macro, you know, malnutrition of the mother. It could be because of the genes, a genetic disorder that are there. It could be because of other environmental factors. So you have to determine what are that, like infections, you know, the child could get an infection that would also interfere with the development of the brain and therefore uh, result to that small head. So, when you get such a child, you refer them to the physician, and then more tests are going to be done, and then you get the cause. Once you have the cause, if it's a medical, they are going to treat it medically. If it's an infection, they are going to give the appropriate medical treatment. If it's genetics, there is little that we can do about genes because some people are just that way. So it could be that's the way they are. If it's a nutritional problem, now you must come up with an appropriate intervention. Now you, you have to see if it is the child is not getting adequate to eat, that is now where you come up with your nutrition recommendation. You have to prescribe a diet that is sufficient enough with all macronutrients and the micronutrients. So yes, I hope I have answered the key question of uh, Esther Otien, that we really have to rule out what is the problem. And if it is our purpose as a nutritionist, the key thing there will be a balanced diet. If the child is not able to eat properly, we might uh, consider the parental nutrition. If they're able to feed orally, then we'll advise the guardians or the mother with the proper diet and how to administer that diet to be fully, uh, to receive all the nutrients, optimal nutrition that there. Then just to answer another question before I go on with our session, because we'll continue answering questions even later on. Somebody is um, asking, what is the difference between malnutrition and dehydration? Now, when we talk about malnutrition, we have a malnutrition. Malnutrition is when there is, it is caused by imbalance of nutrients in the body. We have undernutrition and we have overnutrition. Those are the two types of nutrition. Undernutrition is when we do not have sufficient uh, nutrients or the nutrients are imbalanced such that we have more, more of some nutrients and less of other nutrients. It will cause some deficiencies and some um, problems which could result to undernutrition. And overnutrition is when we have too much nutrients such that it would result to things such as obesity and overweight. 
So that is basically malnutrition, which is class Y being under and overnutrition. Now, dehydration is when the body does not have adequate fluid. You, you have lost a lot of water. Remember, it is essential that in the body we have adequate fluid. It is through this uh, fluid that uh, helps the composition of blood, that helps the various biochemical reactions that occur in the body to go on, that helps in the disposal of waste. That is why we need to have adequate in lemons water in the body. So if you do not have enough water, you will lack enough fluid in your body and it will have a bad um, environment for the processes that take, care in, take place there in the body, you become dehydrated. One of the first um, symptoms of dehydration is that you might feel thirsty. That means your body is asking for more water and fluids. Or you may have dried lips. So dehydration is when you do not have enough of that water or fluid in the body that helps the body maintain a good environment for all its processes. So I hope I have also answered that. Now, let me just finish um, the body composition methods and then I'll go on and answer some questions as we go on. Now, we were talking about the sophisticated body composition measurements. And we are saying that um, these messages, uh, these methods are used in clinical setups because they require sophisticated equipment, some types of X-rays and the scans that usually classify the body components and quantify them. So some of the um, technologies that are used are the scan, that is the DEXA. We have the MRI, that is magnetic resonance imaging, and the CT, that is computed tomography, you know, types of uh, X-rays that also give the components of the body. And we have the bioelectrical impedance um, analysis, which is now very common because we have small portable devices uh, which we use to evaluate the body composition of individuals. This is very common, commonly used. We also have one here at Humanitarian Global, which we can, for people who are interested, if you need, we can also guide you on how to use the portable bioelectric impedance analysis um, machine. It also gives the various components of the, the body and quantifies them and it has its own reference standards. So those are, they give very reliable results. Those are the other sophisticated body composition measurements. So we have come to the end of the measurements that have assessed body composition just a recap, we are seeing in anthropometry, we divided those me me methods into two, where we said some methods measure, the measurements are used to assess growth and the other methods are used to assess body composition. So I hope that it can be clear. Just to answer a quick question before I move on to the next session, somebody is asking, Lokudu is asking, how do we treat malnutrition medically? Now we have a, another session, a very detailed session on management of malnutrition. So to answer you, Lokudu, maybe you can get in touch with us later and we could um, um, present you with our session on management of malnutrition. It's a big content, a detailed content, but it, the reason why we are doing nutrition assessment is so that we can handle the malnutrition. So we have a whole session for that, I hope you can get in touch with us so that we can organize for a session, a whole session for that. Okay, then we can move on. Just a moment. Uh, just a moment.
as we try and uh, sort out a technical issue, we are going to be back in a few. But I can see we are still posting our questions and I'd encourage you to po continue posting them on the Q&A and we shall be delighted to have them answered. I think we are back uh, with our presentation. Yes, Annette, we can proceed. Okay. Um, as I was saying, now we are through with the, these methods of. Um, Bear with us for a while. Okay. Sorry for that glitch. Now, I would also want to mention uh, something else with anthropometric measurements. We mention nutrition index or anthropometric indices. We have heard about them. Now, when we take the anthropometric measurements in order to work out the nutrition status, we sometimes uh, use indices. Now, indices is when we combine measurements with each other, we combine some measurements with other data in order to work out anthropometric indices. You can say an index is a combination of two anthropometric measurements or one measurement plus the person's age. These indices, we use them to make inferences or to infer the body composition, the growth and development. And we have some examples here of the nutrition indices. Before we have that example, let's take a small break. As I answer some questions, some people are saying that I shouldn't answer a question. Somebody asked about anthropometric measurement and asked for children with special needs, how do you take the measurements? Now, we have special, specialized ways to take and specialized standards and ways to take children with the children or adults with the special um, conditions. I'll just give an example of what I mean. If you have an adult or a child and they are disabled and you cannot take their height, and you need that height measurement in order to work out the nutrition status using some other method. How would you do that? So we will take the length, the arm length, because there are references that have shown people of certain heights of some sex and of certain height will have an arm length of a certain length. So we are going to take the arm length of the disabled person, and then we are going to look at the reference and see for the normal people with a similar arm length, how tall they are, what is their height. And then now we are going to use, assume that the person who cannot stand with a similar arm length of the person who can stand are of the same height. And if that is a measurement that we needed to use, then we can always uh, use it that way. Now, that is an example of how we use. So we are, we are going to say that there are special methods and special references that are used 
for anthropometric measurements for people with special needs. And also for continue to present the presentation for those people who have just joined we are going to share our presentation so don't be worried about it now some of the indexes that we use are the ones i want to give the uh, example and before we give the example of the index, I also want to mention an indicator. Now that we have said an index is when we combine two measurements, anthropometric measurements, we calculate some index there. We have to use some cutoff points to check what the index means. So an is when we combine the index with a specific cut of point, which will help us to determine the nutrition status of the individual or the population. We'll give an example here. For example, we have BMI, body mass index. It is a value that we usually derive from the mass of a, and the height of a person. So we need the mass in kilograms of a person, and then we take their height in meters, and then we work out uh, an index where we divide the mass of that person in kilograms, we divide by their height in meters squared, which will give us value, meaning uh, every kilogram of the meter squared of the person. That is what we call the body mass index. And this body mass index will give us an indication of the person's body weight. It will tell us the ideal body weight of the person. So remember we said indices, we combine two measurements. Now an indicator is what it means. When the index is combined with the meaning of the cutoff point, the indication, that is what we call a nutrition indicator. Let's give an example here. Now, if you take your weight in kilograms and divide by your height in meters squared, if that index follow below, if it is eight, less than 8.5 and you are an adult, this is for adults, we also have other for children that we are going to mention, then indicates that you are weight, underweight. So the index there is 18.5. The indication is that the person is underweight. So this is the cut of points of the body mass index for adults. 18.5 to 25 index means that is the ideal body range. It falls within the range recommended body weight for a person. And if it is between 25 to 30, then it means that this person falls within the ovary of weight range. If it is 30 or higher, it means that the person is obese. And when it comes to obese, we have classes of obesity. If the BMI falls um, 30 to 35, that is class one, 35 to 40, that is class two. And class three is a high BMI of 40. That means severe obesity. So that is an example of an index. And the nutrition indicator there, we say when you combine the index with the um, cut of points to give an indication is being underweight or ideal, that is the indication. Now, the other common nutrition indices that are used uh, in an anthropometric measurements in the humanitarian context, we have weight for age, weight for length or height, height for length or for age, BMI for age. These are normally used for the young people. Now, these measurements, we take the weight and then we work out for the age. We use cut points that are provided by statistical tools that are called Z scores and the percentile that are uh, found from various sources, the most common sources being who, and also. Now, the Z scores and percentiles here, we are being told, are usually widely used to assess and monitor the growth and nutrition status for the young people of 
young, uh, up to 19 years of age, that is the young people. Now, the percentile and z-scores of anthropometry, these are statistical tools that help assess a child's growth and status relative to a reference standard or standard population. Now, these reference or standard population are the ones that are presented in tables and charts by provided by different databases. Here we are talking about the WHO, and we are talking also about the CDC and other sources, even internal sources of based on the country that you are in or the project that you are working on. So you take specific measurements, compare them with the reference standards or and references, you know, the references that are presented in the tables in terms of standard deviations, that is the Z scores or percentile. These are usually uh, found there in We have a whole session that can polish up your skills on how to use Z scores and percentiles in another session because we cannot cover it here, but just understand for now that we use them. And when we use them, we are able to classify the indexes. Like for example, weight for age. Here we are looking at the child's weight and their age. Now this index will be used in growth monitoring where we are assessing if the children are heavy enough for their age. So here we use the weight of the child and then we compare it to a standard, a standard range of children of the same age who are, are recommended, who have now a standard weight. We compare the weight of this child to that age group to see if they are underweight or overweight. And how, how overweight they may be. We use the charts provided by the Z-scores and the percentiles. And then we have another one, common one, weight for height, which is also an index that is used for assessing wasting. Now here we are looking at, are they heavy enough for their height? So we will be knowing if they are thin, or when we look at that, if you look at it, we will know if they are wasted. So wasting is a form of art malnutrition, which means thinness, they do not have enough muscle for their height, for the frame of height that they have. So it is defined, wasting is defined as the low weight for the height of the child compared to the standard child of the same height. Another common one is height for age. We are looking if the child is as tall as they should be for the other children of the same age. And here we can find children who are not growing as tall as they should be. And of course, they're usually over layers. Over, you know, they're of course, in every population, some children are very short compared to the children of their age. Others are very tall compared. Now we will rule out, we will further evaluate to rule out that it's not a genetic problem, you know, because if you have a short parent, you don't expect to be tall. But we rule out if the cause of the stunting is nutritional. And if it is nutritional, we know that it is chronic malnutrition. And now we have to act upon a nature of malnutrition so that we can see if we can help the child as much as we can. BMI for age. Now, remember the first thing we dealt with and we gave the cut of points, it was for adults. Now for children, especially children above two years to the adolescents, people who are not adults, we normally use BMI for age. We don't use BMI, the normal BMI for adults. So we have um, tables and charts provided by the uh, and CDC. And they usually, we work out the BMI as normal for the child. And then based on age and sex, we compare to see if the BMI falls within the range of the children of the same age and sex. And now we can uh, evaluate them whether they are underweight or overweight or obese based 
on the children. We are there, we have an illustration which is more detailed in other session about uh, the use of the discourse and percentage, percentile. And uh, we can always share that session with people to make sure that we polish up. Now, just to conclude this, because time is not on our side, we want to know the advantages of using anthropometric measurements. General advantages is that it's safe, it is simple, and it's not invasive. And um, these methods can be applied to a large sample size. And um, it is objective. It's not objective, but objective with high sensitivities and specificity. That is if you do it right, and then it can be done by any healthcare provider without specialized training. You don't have to be um, a nutritionist, you don't have to be, you, any person who is a health provider can do it. And uh, they can just need to need the proper skills of doing it. But that is that um, it only covers limited nutrition diagnosis. It needs further um, information to back up that. And then it does not measure, it cannot identify protein and micronutrient deficiencies or detect small disturbances of nutrient, nutritional status. If you, you measure your anthropometric measurement, your height or weight, it might not give you specific information on what nutrient deficient it is. It will just indicate that you are not of the ideal or of the standard or the reference within the range of the measurements required, but do not give you the real problem. Now, in the circumstances where you do not have good equipment or the personnel is not very skilled, you may erroneous data, which will have an impact on the rest of the, on the nutrition care process. So those are the disadvantages. So, let me see if there are other questions that we can answer. Somebody had asked what about the body mass index and ideal body weight. I hope we have covered that where we have showed the how to work out the body mass index and we have also showed the reference standards. There is also that one, how can we treat malnutrition medically? We have said there is a management of malnutrition session that we cover that in our other, whereby we determine the level of malnutrition and we offer a special feeding programs for the special cases that we are there. Just looking at your questions before we go on. Okay. I don't seem to see the others. You can just ask directly after we finish because we are almost finished. Now, remember we said anthropometric measurement is the first um, that we are looking at for assessing the nutrition. Now, our second method is biochemical assessment or other ways, the one that we assessment, uh, laboratory assessment. Now here, body samples are evaluated. We use to look at the level of nutrients or their metabolites. And the person's samples that are commonly used, the blood samples, the urine samples, the stool samples, sometimes we even use hair samples. And this is performed by the nutritionist. We do not have that, not unless in your project they give you some training for that. But we have work and they provide results based on their laboratory. They have the the report our clients and individuals come to you with. So it is our duty to be able to interpret or to read the notes of the medical lab technician so that we can know the extent of the problem. Now in nutrition and dietetics, we are not really interested in all types of, you know, laboratory assessment. We are interested in those nutrition status. the interpretation. So some of the tests 
that may be done will help us discover the deficiencies or the metabolic problems affecting the nutrition status and health. Some of the tests that are done are like a complete blood count. You know, in such complete, for example, one of the components of complete blood test, it may be, for example, hemoglobin levels that for us as nutritionists will make sense for us because we will be able to, if a patient is suffering from some type of anemia or not, you know, the serum protein, the serum micronutrient levels, the serum lipids, the glucose levels, all are nutrient related tests, which will give us an indication of whether the patient is having a deficiency of those nutrients, whether they have a problem of metabolizing those nutrients, or if they have ANOVA, if they have a, a more increased level of those nutrients because of one reason or another, because of increased intake or because of metabolic problems. From there on, when we're able to interpret what is the, uh, the test, it, it can help us, it can contribute to help us uh, make decisions about how to help the client. Now, the advantages of biochemical assessment is because it is that they have helped us to pick up the earliest indication of malnutrition or any nutrition deficiencies in the body. And they are also able to confirm the clinical diagnosis of nutrition status. They are very reliable because they show the exact amount of the levels of the metabolites or the nutrients in the body samples. The disadvantages, they are time consuming, they're invasive, they need a trained personnel, that is a medical lab technology person. They need to, the health practitioner may need to run multiple biological tests for a proper diagnosis, and this may be expensive and challenging to conduct for large populations. So those are the disadvantages of the biochemical test. Okay, I can't seem to see any question. I will continue to the third method. Now there's a question here that I can answer before we continue. Um, Ageja is asking, after assessing the case of severe acute malnutrition in a child, which nutrients is essential for immediate inter intervention? Now, just to answer this, after and we find that a child is severely malnourished, we have to know the cause of that malnutrition, and we will find that most causes is because of a deficiency of energy and protein. And of course, energy and protein deficiencies are not alone. They, we also have micronutrient deficiencies because micronutrients, they help the body utilize the macronutrients properly. So we will put the child in a feeding program um, in which we are going to offer some formulas that are well balanced, that have the proper um, nutrients and the proper quantities and the proper utilization capability for the child. So if you're asking about the nutrients, I'm going to answer you, is that severe acute malnutrition refers to a situation whereby the child has lacked the proper macronutrients coupled with the micronutrients. So whatever nutrients we give them will be the macronutrients. And then we also have to consider to give a formula that is rich in micronutrients. This management of some occurs in phases as we are going to see in our session of management of malnutrition. It will come into phases, phase one, there's an intermediate phase, and the other phase. 
So after doing this, we put this child in a feeding uh, program or a management or nutrition program. And just to answer you that we have a, a full session management or nutrition that we can explore further exactly what kind of food to give and how to give it or what kind of formulas are used in various circumstances of management or nutrition. So um, let's move clinical nutrition assessment before I answer more questions. Now in the clinical nutrition assessment, we look at the signs and the symptoms that can use to detect nutrition. Now, the signs are the things that we can see, the symptoms our clients, our, uh, our patients must tell us how they are feeling about, uh, about those are the symptoms. Now, the health practitioner will examine the various areas of the patient bodies to discover any signs of nutrient deficiencies. Now, the most common places that we examine is the eye, the skin, the hair, the nails, the lips, the tongue, all those. You will see some abnormalities in those body parts that may indicate several um, problems that come nutrient deficiency. Now, we said you have also to ask to interview the patient or the individuals, ask them how they feel. You will get feedback, such feedback such as uh, somebody is, may be feeling fatigued, another one may be feeling dizzy. You have to note all that down because all that information, you will use it to indicate what the problem can be. So that is what is clinical nutrition assessment. In the clinical nutrition assessment, we also take the med medical history of the patient. We also uh, take all other relevant information. Do they use medication? Are they suffering from any medical condition? Are they using any supplement? All that kind of information, all that type of history, you also note it down because it will also have an impact on um, the kind of information that you're going to collect and that is going to help you to make a nutrition diagnosis. Now, these are some of the examples of the physical signs uh, that you could come across. They are not all of them. We, uh, there, is a, there are tables that exist and there are pictures that exist that show you exactly what to expect. These are just some of them to show you what you could expect. In the first picture there, we are seeing edema. You can see that child on the foot there, the practitioner is pressing and then it is leaving an indentation there. It is called bilateral. That is meaning it is on both feet, pitting edema. That could be an indication of uh, a protein deficiency. The second picture, the eye there, that is the betot spot. It could indicate vitamin A deficiency. There is a picture there of a, a wasted child. You can see a um, child that uh, you can, the ribs are showing it's a big child, it's a big tummy. That could be an indication of um, waste. And there is a lady there with an extended neckline that is um, the thyroid gland is swollen. That is an indication of iodine. It's a sign of iodine deficiency. That is goiter. Other examples are like the nails. You can look the first picture here that is showing uh, it could imply vitamin B12 deficiency, the nails there. You can see those ridges or straight lines along the lines there shows vitamin B12 deficiency. And those are the picture there, there is a calcium deficiency one, there's a white mark there. Iron deficiency, you can see some discoloration of the nails, uh, nail polish, but because naturally there is some discoloration there, but some very white parts and discoloration could show iron deficiency. Zinc deficiency, so many white marks there. Uh, niacin deficiency looks like that picture there. So, so these are just some few examples of physical signs that can be seen to help together with other symptoms and together with other methods to determine the nutrition status of individuals. Maybe we can have just a two minute break before we go on as we look at the questions.
Any other questions, kindly uh, keep posting them on the Q&A session. Uh, Manette will be answering them as she continues. Uh, I think you may yeah, proceed. Yeah, actually it was not a technical glitch. I was just saying, let me look at the questions. But um, I've seen the last questions. We can answer them after our last part here, which is the dietary assessment. This is the other method of nutrition assessment. Now, dietary assessment is um, it's a process of assessing the nutritional or food intakes of humans. And we assess this food intake or nutrition intake so that we can detect any type of nutri nutrient deficiency. So we look at the feeding patterns and the nutrient intakes to see if there could be any nutrition deficiency that could affect nutrition status. Now, when we do a dietary assessment, it allows us to identify the actionable areas of change in the diet and the lifestyle of that individual or population in order to improve the overall well-being. So we will see where the problem in terms of their nutrition intake, then now rectify that. You can recommend the changes that they can make so that these people are well again. They have now optimal nutrition and they have also good nutrition status. Now, we are not going to go to details, but I'll just mention some of the common methods that are used in the dietary assessment. They involve doing a dietary history, some uh, tools of food records, some uh, 24 hour recall methods. And we also have the food frequency questionnaire. Now to touch briefly, a diet history is when um, people, an individual or people, they give a history of what they have habitually fed on their diet. You know, when we define diet, we say this is the kind of takes. So somebody gives you an account, the food that they have normally con consumed from early in life, and uh, you can get a picture of what the problem with their diet or what could be the deficiency, uh, the deficiency observed from that diet based on their long-term history. Food records here, we request our clients to record the foods that they consume for a specific period of time. And then we look at those records and also detect any deficiencies or overconsumption in order to come with a, up with a, a diagnosis. 24 recall is a um, short method just for 24 hours. We tell the uh, we work client for everything that they ingest, including beverages, including foods, anything that they ingest, they record it for the 24 hours. And then we also analyze to see if there is optimal nutrition. This also in the clinical setup with some biochemical tests where we have for 24 hours, we do some laboratory tests to see how the body is metabolizing some of these nutrients in order to detect some uh, problems um, metabolism that could affect their nutrition status. A food frequency questionnaire is a um, common type of interview that is used whereby we use uh, some questionnaire either in soft copy or in hard copy. Uh, some times the clients can fill them by themselves or we can conduct the questions. And it's a question. Uh, these questions, we ask how frequent the consumers use certain categories of food, either um, daily, monthly, in order to get a glimpse of how often they feed on specific types of food and how much of those foods they feed so that we can now 
have a picture of their dietary intake that will help us detect any deficiencies or overconsumption. So briefly, that is just briefly saying, those are some of the method, common methods that are used for dietary assessment. At this juncture, I need to mention that of all the methods that we have covered, the ABCD methods, the dietary assessment method cannot be well conducted by any other person other than a nutritionist and dietitian. As dietary measurements, any other health practitioner conduct it. Biochemical is conducted by the medical laboratory personnel. Clinical symptoms can be conduct conducted by the physician and clinician. But when it comes to the dietary assessment methods, we really need to get our um, assessment method right because this is an area that's sorely left for the nutritionist to conduct. It we come in handy to conduct these methods, and that is why we should be very, very uh, conversant with these methods that are being used. Now, the advantages of dietary assessment is that it provides contextual information about a person's nutrition intake. And these results are largely accurate, mostly, not all the time, but they are mostly accurate due to the more detailed description of the foods and the portion. And therefore, they can give us a, a correct analysis or a, a correct intake of the people. Now, it has disadvantages. The methods might rely on accurate recall of the dietary intake, and this may present a problem, especially if the recall is expected for a long period of, of time. Some people might have forgotten what they have been feeding on for a very long period of time. Now, it is also prone to misreporting, especially when the health practitioner adopts full frequency questionnaire for data gathering. Now, some clients or individuals uh, might misreport, might put some information that is uh, not accurate, and this may lead to some problems when it comes to nutrition status or nutrition assessment, because the information that they provided is not correct. So those are some of the very few disadvantages. They are not all. We are just uh, mentioning the few ones. Now, allow me just to conclude and then we answer our questions because we started late, our time is also gone. Now, when we do the nutrition assessment, this nutrition assessment is applicable in various contexts. Somebody was asking um, the application of the nutrition assessment. I didn't answer the question directly, but I also get back to them, how we apply this nutrition assessment in various contexts the humanitarian context. Now, when we are doing, we are, we are having nutrition emergencies, starvation, they are, because there is a famine for one reason or another, we need to a quick picture of what is happening with the nutrition status of a population or a subgroup. Nutrition assessment can be used in a type of um, screening where we say it is a simple and rapid first line process of identifying patients who are already malnourished or at risk of becoming malnourished. Now, the patients with nutritional risk should subsequently undergo a more detailed nutrition assessment to identify and quantify specific nutrition problems. So nutrition screening is one way that we can use nutrition assessment. Most common method of nutrition screening should be simple and used. So we find that we use the MWAC to, in a certain population, we just need to take the MWAC of the children, of the adults, of the pregnant, of pregnant ladies and expectant and lactating ladies. And it will give us a picture, a simple picture of the nutrition status of that population, where now we can uh, recommend other actions to be taken. So that is one application of the nutrition assessment. That is nutrition screening. That is in a humanitarian, global, uh, humanitarian context. The other one 
rotation survey. Now, in the surveys, we assess the nutritional status of the selected population to identify the group at risk for chronic malnutrition or for evaluation of the existing nutrition problems in order to formulate nutritional policies. Now, in time and time again, we have heard of various nutrition surveys that have taken part in various parts of the country or even of the continent. And that's a population and we do, uh, we use nutrition assessment to assess the nutrition status of that selected population. And then we are able to identify some group of people who are at risk of for chronic malnutrition or of some nutrient deficiency. Like now, these surveys are the ones that are able to help us to come up with some policies. Like now, to name an, a simple example, when some surveys have been conducted in the past, we recognize some nutrient deficiency of public significance. That is why we recognize that um, the pregnancy or the pregnant ladies were having um, a lot of deficiencies in the iron and folic acid. So we came up with some policies that advocated for the use of such things. We did some research a long time ago and we identified that there was iodide deficiencies. And that is how we decided to also come with some policies, the result of which of using iodized salt, such things. So many policies are dependent on the nutrition surveys that are done. And nutrition surveys, you have to use nutrition assessment methods for you to get the nutrition data that is used to evaluate the problems. And we also use in this nutrition, nutrition assessment, we also apply them in the nutrition surveillance, where we continuous, continuously monitor the dietary intake and nutrition status of a population or selected population group using the various data collection methods. And the goal is also for policy formulation and action within the planning. So surveillance is a continuous process. We keep on doing um, collecting nutrition related data so that it can lead us to also come up with the formulation of some nutrition policies that help the well being of our whole population. And finally, when we are carrying out a nutrition intervention in all um, areas, we have to find out if the interventions that we came up with, the planned care or the nutrition intervention that we recommended is working. The only way we can do that is to carry out a nutrition assessment and compare it with the baseline. What we did first in order to evaluate the problem, to get the nutrition problem, after carrying out the nutrition intervention, we also do another nutrition assessment to evaluate if our intervention have worked, if the nutrition related behavior or the environmental condition or any aspect of health that we have changed has worked for the well being of the community. So, those are some of the uh, humanitarian uh, contexts in which nutrition assessment is used. Now, this can be nutrition assessment can be applied in many fields and in very many projects, as long as you need to get the nutrition status of individuals. So I'm going to rest there. And maybe I'll hand over to Eric to say something as we prepare for our answer questions, our question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Annette, for the broad and informative session that we've had. Uh, we have learned a lot, all of us, and uh, uh, welcome any questions. I can see we have a few on the Q&A.
the question, you are free to raise your hand. I will be allowing you to talk and then we can ask your question and our speaker of the day will get to answer. So maybe just omit some of the questions, I think from the Q&A. Okay, um, just to answer some uh, questions here, I'm seeing what are the best, what are the best uh, from Badal Mohammed? What are the best nutrition assessment methods? And um, just to answer that first, now we cannot say that they are the best and the less than best nutrition assessment methods. It will choice of the nutrition assessment method used will de depend on your situation, on your project. It will depend on the suspected uh, condition or, or you are, let's just say it will depend on the outcome that you want. Now, for instance, if an individual comes to you with a um, specific um, request for you to carry out some sort of nutrition assessment, look at it and see the viability of what they are requesting for, and you may agree with them or disagree with them. Or in other cases, you may need to know at the expected outcomes of the nutrition assessment. And those expected outcome are the ones that will determine whether you are going to use one method or a combination of methods because you just don't use a method. In fact, in most nutrition assessment, you use a combination of methods so that they can back each other. If you use anthropometric measurement, you might need to use the clinical symptoms and the signs. And also you may need or not to use a biochemical test, but all times, all times when we are doing a nutrition assessment and we are nutrition and dietetics, we must evaluate the nut nutrient intake of the individuals. We have to look at the nutrient intake because it will infer or it will give us of what kind of nutrition related problems they are. That is the reason why we are nutritionists and uh, dietitians. So I'm answering from the point of a nutrition and dietitian and I'm saying that we can use one or two or all methods, but it's always important to do a dietary assessment because that is our profession as nutritionists and dietitian to recommend or to find out problems with the nutrition intake. So that is a, an answer for Badal Muhammad. Um, I can see Mustafa. Aiden has his hand up and we can ask him for him okay. to ask a question. Please. Uh, Aiden, you are welcome to ask a question. You can mute your mic. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I'm to the presenter. And thanks for her for good presentation. I could like to ask you, What's the difference between the nutrition assessment and as well as I could like to explain the conceptual framework of malnutrition? Okay, come again. You have said what is it? Yeah, what's the difference between the nutrition assessment when you are conducting the nutrition assessment and when you are conducting the nutrition survey? What's the difference between these two? The difference between nutrition assessment and nutrition? Three. Nutrition selfie. Selfie, selfie. Okay, could you type that? Nutrition please? survey, I think. Oh, no, nutrition, nutrition survey. Yeah. Okay, yes. survey. Yeah. Okay, yes. yeah. No worries. It's uh, based on where we are uh, going on. Now, nutrition assessment in very simple terms, is when we are trying to establish the nutrition of an individual or a group or a population. So here we are trying 
to establish the nutrition status. So it is just that action of collecting data so that we can take this data and use it to determine the nutrition status. I hope you are clear on what is nutrition assessment. Now, when we come to a nutrition survey, now we are going to use the nutrition assessment. That is now the collection of data, data using the ABCD methods. And we are going to apply this in a selected population. We are, we are going to go there out in the community, in our target population, and we are going to collect data on so many individuals. That is the nutrition data. We are going to do nutrition assessment on so many individuals. And then we are going to analyze this data and come up with the nutrition problem of that population. So to answer you, what is the difference mm -hmm. between nutrition assessment and the nutrition survey is that we use nutrition assessment, assessment to conduct the nutrition. Nutrition assessment is a method of collecting data for the survey. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. Is this, and uh, these terms can be, inter sometimes can be interchangeable names. Uh, some people interchange it, but uh, those are the laymen, people who, the lay people who interchange it, but us as professionals, it should just be clear for us <laughs> that we are yeah. using nutrition assessment to collect data in the nutrition survey. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if you are conducting a survey and the, the survey that you are conducting, you are collecting data, what you are doing is you are doing nutrition assessment. You're using nutrition assessment to collect data for the your survey. The other question was about uh, malnutrition. Um, Annette, before yes. you go there, and see Chadwick Digo has his hand up. Okay. okay. The next question. Chadwick Digo, you can unmute your mic. Hello. 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 Zuri. Hello. Hello. Yeah, teacher, the, I could like to answer the next question. Okay. Oh, the other one was you are talking about, you wanted to know what is a malnutrition, what context of malnutrition? It, it, the other question, it was the conceptual framework for yes, malnutrition. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's a conceptual. You, explain that. you want me to explain the conceptual uh, framework for malnutrition? Yeah. Where we have various causes of malnutrition. Yes. Now, the conceptual framework for mal, uh, malnutrition is it shows the causes of malnutrition um, from various causes. Mm. There is a flow chart that is uh, provided that shows the causes of malnutrition. Maybe I could share that with you. I don't have it here in this presentation, but in this conceptual framework for causes of malnutrition, it shows the various uh, causes of malnutrition in different levels. Some are immediate causes, others are underlying causes, others are even uh, causes that do not have to do with the individual who is suffering from the malnutrition. So maybe we could share that conceptual framework for malnutrition and the, the flow chart, because it's a flow chart and from there. I, we could do an inbox to you or we could do another session. I'm finding it a little bit difficult to explain without the flow chart here. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. I've noted your name. I'm going to forward that to you. Uh, thank you, Arden, for your question. I think I saw another hand up. Uh, can I have Chadwick? I think. 
I think we can uh, have a, a Dika, Christopher. You can unmute your mic and uh, you may ask your question. Yeah, I, I just want to make some bit of, all right, thank you so much uh, for the presentation, madam. Uh, I just want, wanted to add more on the nutrition survey and nutrition assessment to my colleague. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add on nutrition survey. Nutrition survey is also information. A survey is like to conduct a study on, on a large population, but an assessment is just to obtain information on the nutrition status of that particular person. So that is just what I wanted to, to add on to. So the other thing I wanted to ask is about niacin deficiency. Uh, what, uh, uh, what that uh, uh, deficiency. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's actually it is a very good um, input that you have um, put. It is true about the nutrition survey, what you have done. Thank you for that input. And it is absolutely uh, correct. Now, niacin deficiency will result to a condition that is called teragra. And um, teragra is a condition that has very little type of protein, amino acid that is called um, tryptophan in the diet. And in the metabolism of um, or of the utilization, so that you can have amino acids, uh, the tryptophan, you need some vitamins that aid in protein metabolism. And that is why now you asked, I, if I got your question, Right, you may have asked what is the intervention for niacin deficiency. Now, after understanding that Karagra is what results from niacin deficiency, and the major problem is that we have a little or we have deficiency in tryptophan, then it goes without saying that you need a diet rich in protein, and we need now the vitamin B3, which will help in the metabolism of protein so that we can have the adequate tryptophan in the diet. So that is my comment on that. Um, that is well answered. Thank you, Annette. I can see we have uh, Abdisalam Mohammed. Can I meet your mic? And uh, you may ask your question. Welcome. Abdisalam, are you there with us? You can unmute your mic. I think uh, he's not here. Uh, Chadwick, are you there with us? Yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Now, you are welcome to ask your question. Thank you so much, team. I think this is a credible and worthy uh, presentation on it. Um, mine is just more of an addition, and uh, and, and also just to think. Uh, I think uh, as we look around these areas, uh, the core humanitarian studies in nutrition assessment, I think uh, it's also key that we add other things, which are the public health, and also look at uh, things like water, sanitation, and even shelter. That's the second thing, and this one I think I don't know how we can bring it on board. Do you think Annette, uh, that you can use stable isotopes in nutrition assessment? And this, this is coming as a result whereby there's now a widespread technique use of them and they're becoming more popular in the world now, whereby we can add them. I don't know where we can add them in the assessment, but what okay. you have been generally. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your comments, Chadwick. It's possible to consider what you're saying. Um, thank you, Chadri. I can see uh, Abby Gena. Are you there with us? Near yeah, Abby Gena. You can unmute your mic. Uh, 
Abi, can you hear me? Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, and uh, you are welcome to us. I was I was just looking for the mic, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just want to have two points only. One about the template about this assessment. Thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this uh, this webinar. It's really very helpful. Uh, maybe if we could have also a kind of uh, template or uh, an uh, uh, to conduct the nutritional assessment in which uh, uh, it can be helpful to to remotely sometimes like you know we normally do as a christian we do uh, such kind of assessment using the robot so it would be much appreciated if you can share us any 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 guideline or tools that has been developed by by you guys and the next one is a kind of i want to to to, to to ask you that if uh, our country have a, a, a Sokota declaration in which in 2030 20, 20, 20, that we will minimize uh, 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 the uh, malnutrition, uh, we normally targeted more than 200 districts, but uh, uh, normally, you know, assessment and survey are very different. So uh, does this 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 assessment can align with uh, with such declarations that has been made in some country of the Africa, like Ethiopia, so that we can we can able to come up on the same page. So maybe will it be uh, kind of a complementing or not? That's my the second point. And uh, finally, I appreciate uh, uh, you could able to share us the presentation at the end. Thank you. Over to you. Um, that is a good question. Just to remind everyone, we are sharing the presentations to your emails. And uh, most of you have been sharing the emails with us and have been uh, writing them down. And after the session, uh, we shall share the slides, the recording of this session to all your emails. Thank you. Annette, you can uh, answer the question. OK, I didn't get a question there. He was just suggesting that we can um, share in the future that we can share mm -hmm. some tools or probably yeah. softwares that have been developed yeah. mm -hmm. to help to assess nutrition uh, for, yeah. to help with nutrition assessment yes there are some softwares that have been developed to help with nutrition actually the storage and the, um, the analysis of the nutrition data and information in order to come up with nutrition assessment. So in future, we can actually have a session on that. It's, it's uh, where we can share the most latest and the credible um, nutrition assessment tools and assessment that have been universally or internationally recognized so that you can use them. So thank you for that input that has just given us an idea uh, we work together with our partners to bring you that material of the most current the tools that are being used. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, Annette. Okay, uh, on the same, same note, just just mm -hmm. to continue on the same note, um, and okay. seeing uh, people who, I have seen questions that people are interested in knowing on how to manage the various nutrition problems. Just please note that we have a session on management of nutrition, which will give in more details and accuracy of the various way to manage different conditions of malnutrition and the nutrient deficiencies. So do not worry, we can also be able to share that session with you when you get with touch with, with us in the management of malnutrition. And um, the person who was interested in a nutrition survey, and uh, we also um, offer some sessions on nutrition emergencies. We will cover the nutrition survey there, very, and also some sessions in food security that can also cover. And some other people who are inter interested in knowing the deficiency of nutrients and then um, the, you know, all those things that you can. We also have an introduction session 
on one nutrition. That is the macronutrients and nutrients that are here in human nutrition. We cover them what they are, we cover their sources, we cover their deficiencies, we cover the, the food sources, all that. So you could always get in touch with us and we can offer you a detailed session, even on on one, so that you can be everything in nutrition that we have to share. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Annette. Uh, Simon, Agongo Azure, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative for the presentation. You did so well. Uh, the question I have is, uh, among the ABCD methods, which one is uh, best for emergency in nutrition? For instance, if you receive entry, which method is best to do your quick assessment? And the second question has to do with uh, the dietary methods used at the population level. What you have told us, at, I understand that is at the individual level. But if you are assessing dietary intake at the population level, what methods will you be looking at? Thank you very much for your question. I'll start with the one, which is the quickest method of ABCD to use, like in an emergency. And um, the quickest method would be to do a nutrition screening to, so that you can get a clear, quick picture of the nutrition status of the individuals whereby you can proceed now with interventions and then more actions. So the recommended one is usually anthropometric measurements, specifically the MOAC, MOAC tape because it is non-invasive, it's very quick to use, it does not uh, require, I don't think it bridges any cultural beliefs or lifestyles for people. So anthropometric measurement would be most suited to be applied as a first line nutrition assessment um, to in an emergency situation. I hope that one I have answered. Now, you have also asked about a dietary method that can be used in a population setup. Now, um, in the practice that we, we do in the field, we have commonly used the food frequency questionnaire and we have conducted it as an interview. And uh, we use uh, sometimes the focus groups where you have a group there, the community, you have the mothers in a certain village, and then you stand there with your questionnaire and you ask them, because not everybody is a literate, you ask, you use your food frequency questionnaire and together with other components, you use a tailored questionnaire to ask questions to get information that will help you to do um, a dietary assessment. So I hope that uh, that has been helpful. So in the community, I'm saying we use a questionnaire with a food frequency component and the health practitioner is able to get the information by asking questions and the community or the people there can answer and they fill in the answer in the questionnaire. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you Thank so much. You. Welcome. Uh, thank you for that. And I can see time is not on our side. So we are going to do our best to keep on answering your questions. We have shared our email and phone number there. We have also shared our website on the chat. I can share it again. Uh, we can continue engaging through the email or through phone number that is for WhatsApp, just to keep on answering your question. Uh, just also a reminder that uh, we will be sharing the recordings of this session and also the slides through your emails. Uh, most of you have been able to send the email and I have collected all emails and we'll be sharing that. And uh, just to close this session, I'd like to invite Anthony just to share the closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric and uh, Annette and uh, also our participants for following up with our session. I think uh, it has been a, a fruitful one and uh, we've been uh, able to uh, learn a lot and uh, this does not stop here. 
Uh, you can always uh, get in touch with our team. Uh, we have training programs uh, where you can even further the learning of uh, what we have covered today. Uh, we have a three months training program on human nutrition and uh, dietetics. You can uh, be able to sign up on that. Uh, we also have a six months uh, training on the same, uh, covering uh, different aspects and also a one year program. Uh, so very many programs on our website. So we would urge you uh, go there, uh, uh, see the course outlines for these uh, training programs. Uh, that is on human nutrition and dietetics. Uh, we also cover maternal infant and young child nutrition. Uh, we also do cover food security and uh, nutrition in emergencies uh, alongside very many other areas. As uh, Chadwick mentioned, uh, we also make sure that uh, we can cover areas on uh, water sanitation and hygiene, monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, procurement and supply chain management alongside very many others. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you for joining our meeting today. Uh, we're going to uh, continue uh, organizing for these kind of sessions. Uh, so we would urge you, you can help us to uh, conduct uh, other sessions, the subsequent ones. You can give us your suggestions, uh, provide some feedback based on the delivery of today's content. Uh, so we are going to be sharing a short survey. Uh, so to help us better deliver this kind of training, uh, we request you humbly uh, to make sure that uh, you can help us in uh, gathering feedback. So thank you once again. And uh, from Humanitarian uh, Global, uh, we would like to I wish you a great time as you go and practice. Uh, also, as you get the recordings, uh, you can share with your colleagues. Uh, and also for subsequent sessions, uh, you can always uh, make sure that you can also uh, share with your friends, with your colleagues, so that we can all get to benefit. So thank you once again, and uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, and uh, have a great time.